Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. We're excited to have you for the first of our three-part series, San Diego's Amazing Race to Combat COVID-19. Um, this is part of our Sets and Science program series. Sets and Science is a monthly program that normally takes place in bars and restaurants, which, of course, right now is a big no-no so we're hosting it online and we're really happy that we're able to do that if you have been to sets and science before thank you so much and welcome back if you haven't experienced sets and science before i'm glad you're here and i hope you will enjoy this talk and that once we uh, resume a somewhat normal life that you will join us in real life as well and i hope that um, it finds you all healthy and safe at home um, San Diego has a very large scientific community, and I don't know that that's something that people realize in San Diego. So we're glad that with this talk series, we can shine a spotlight on the amazing work that is being done in San Diego. Um, of course, with a special focus on COVID-19 right now, but in general, there's amazing science being done in San Diego. Um, and we're glad that we can help um, focus on that a little bit with um, today's talk. Um, and today, as you probably know, we will hear from two fantastic speakers from the San Diego scientific community. The first one will be Dr. Francesca Torriani, and she is the program director of infectious prevention and clinical epidemiology at UCSD Health. Um, she is also an infectious disease specialist, and she will talk um, about us uh, with us a little bit about um, COVID-19 itself, what it is, uh, and what San Diego County um, is especially has been doing to help combat COVID-19, um, what the health strategies are in San Diego County and worldwide. And she's also going to talk to us about testing, how we can test for COVID-19, what tests are available now, um, what they do, what they are. Um, and once uh, Dr. Torriani is done with the presentation. We'll throw it over to Dr. Kate Broderick from, and she is the VP of Clinical Research and Development, of Preclinical Research and Development at Innovio Pharmaceuticals Incorporated here in San Diego. And she will be talking about um, the work that Innovio has been doing um, to develop on a kind of a, a fast tracked um, timeline to find a vaccine for COVID 19. Um, they are one of the companies in San Diego, and I also heard there's companies worldwide work, working on this. So I'm excited to hear what San Diego's contribution uh, to helping us find a vaccine will be. Um, in addition to our wonderful two speakers, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Raiza. <laughs> Hi, Raiza. She is going to help us with the Q&A section of the talk today. So um, while Sets and Science, normally when we do it in life, thrives on the speaker being very close to you and the Q&A section is, is um, a little bit prolonged. Um, we want to give you somewhat of the same experience even if it's online. So we have a Q&A function and you can find that at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A to speech bubble thing. You can type your questions or comments in there. And once both the presentations from Dr. Toriani and from Dr. Broderick are done, we will go to the Q&A section and we'll answer as many questions as we can from you all. Um, but should we not get to yours, um, we will try to answer them afterwards. So stay up um, to date with us on social media. Um, and if you have a question, um, my email is adultprograms at rhfleet.org. So you can always send your questions to me afterwards and I can see if I can get some answers from our speakers and get back to you that way. Um, and that keeps me, that brings me to some housekeeping rules. So we have turned off all the cameras and um, microphones for, uh, for our guests tonight. Um, so only the panelists will be able um, to speak and share their screen and cameras. And that's just to minimize the interruption and keep this a, a safe space. And I think that kind of sums it all up for, yeah, that's all my little notes that I had for today. <laughs> so that kind of sums it up for the um, introduction. Again, thank you for joining us. And with that, we're going to throw it over, oh, down, she's on the left bottom of my screen, to Dr. Torriani. And um, so she's going to take it away for us. Hold on, we're going to unmute you. Yes, thank there you we go. for this wonderful opportunity. This is my first time on this kind of a chat. Um, 
I will uh, show you a couple of slides that will describe the uh, situation worldwide, not so much about the virus itself, which I, I think you probably are aware. Um, so um, SARS-CoV-2 is, is an RNA virus, uh, an enveloped RNA virus uh, that has uh, caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, this pandemic was declared on uh, um, March 11th. It seems like a while. Um, they were following these, uh, uh, the development in all the continents. And as you can see here on this slide, you can see the world epidemic curve. Uh, Europe is uh, at the top. And as you can see, um, it first started in, uh, in Asia, in particular in Wuhan, China. And this was uh, in the first cases were actually in December, but the, the uh, epidemic, the outbreak was recognized at the, in mid-January. Um, and it peaked uh, in February and then it went away and, and rapidly uh, other regions of the world uh, started to have cases. And so um, we, uh, this is where we are. United States or, or Americas are in orange, in deep orange here. Uh, the um, Asia is in gray here, as you can see, Europe uh, is in uh, yellow. And as you can see, the majority of cases in this last week of, of April are uh, in uh, the Americas. So what is the situation worldwide? Uh, this is probably something that you're quite familiar. We look at it very often. It's one of the uh, presentations that I prefer because it gives us basically where the hotspots are. And the hotspots are defined as those that have a, a doubling of cases that is very rapid. So for instance, Myanmar down here has a uh, uh, a doubling of cases that is every three days. Russia is uh, every five days. And as you can see, the United States now are more than uh, seven days. So we've passed this first wave uh, and now we have less. But very importantly, now Mexico and particularly the Baja region uh, right here is, is seeing an increase uh, in cases and that is affecting our region. So you've heard probably uh, in the news uh, this term of flattening the curve and what is the purpose of flattening the curve? The purpose is to decrease the number of cases, new cases every day so that the hospitals in that region can take care of the people who need to be taken care of. Uh, if you have an explosion of cases like we saw in, uh, in Italy and in Spain and in New York City, uh, then the hospital uh, response is basically overwhelmed and that's where uh, bad decisions or difficult decisions need to be made and where people can't really be cared for. So we want to flatten the curve to, to decrease the number of cases arriving, of new cases arriving and needing healthcare um, help. Uh, so you do that uh, with several measures that are described here. One is that you try to identify cases and isolate them and then do contact tracing there uh, that means uh, looking for contacts of these infections of these new infections and then uh, quarantining them uh, so that 
uh, they um, can stay away from transmitting disease if they were to come down with the sickness. Uh, the other measure that you have seen that we've all experienced is school closures uh, and that has happened uh, worldwide and, and in the United States. Uh, and then another measure is workplace closure uh, and uh, just the process of working remotely, which you have also seen. Uh, these stopping uh, crowd events uh, such as concerts or mass gatherings, which we have also seen, uh, and then um, university closures, which also have happened regionally. Um, so by that effect, uh, this has in effect uh, flattened the curve. And you can see here that the cases reporting in the United States have gotten to a plateau right now, and that's where we are so far. And also we have seen a decrease in uh, the number of deaths. Now, clearly this is a, a plateau, so we expect it to probably last quite a, another few days. It has to, the cases then have to decrease as well as the deaths. So what is the situation in San Diego County? Um, these are data provided by San Diego County. I want to point you to uh, really the crux of the matter here, which, is, which are the numbers you can see at the bottom of the chart, uh, which are the new cases uh, by uh, every, two, every day. Um, and as you can see here, we had initially quite few cases and we were and then we had one first wave uh, in uh, at the end of March and then cases decreased again and now we have another rise in cases and the question is what are these cases due well for one thing we've expanded tests so there's much more testing going on and much more testing available. Uh, while before we were limited to only the county, being, first the CDC being able to test, then the county, and then uh, gradually uh, labs in the region also uh, develop testing capacities and so we're able to test many more people. And so that is reflected. And the other factor that uh, is influencing these numbers uh, is also the fact of potentially cases coming in from outside. And so, as I said, there is a situation going on right now in Tijuana with um, many cases uh, being diagnosed, hospitals being filled, uh, and uh, some of the residents who are American nationals and who can cross the border uh, if they're sick uh, are crossing the border. And so this is uh, the increase in cases that we're seeing here. And this is uh, a map uh, that, that uh, shows uh, the cases in San Diego County and the darker the color, uh, the higher number of, of cases. And as you can see, the majority of cases are, that are, have been diagnosed in this last week are in the border uh, with uh, Tijuana. And so that is where we're seeing and another uh, amount of cases is in the region in East County uh, and then some that uh, are, are not shown here because it's another county are also being diagnosed in El Centro. Now, what tests are available? Um, so you have two types of tests. One is a molecular test, which is called RT-PCR. And the RT-PCR basically is um, a, a test that is called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And this is a laboratory technique that combines reverse transcription of RNA, which is the uh, genetic material of uh, this virus, into DNA, and then uh, amplification of specific 
these specific DNA targets using polymerase chain reaction. And this is a test that classically is to diagnose acute disease. So somebody who's actively and acutely infected and may have or may not have symptoms of disease. And we can talk about in the discussion about these um, asymptomatic transmitters and I can, I can answer your questions. But this is really the test that we are widely using in the county to diagnose uh, active disease. And then there is a newer test modality which is called serology and this modality detects antibodies uh, to um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And this uh, indicates a recent or past exposure to a coronavirus. This test, uh, this modality is not useful to diagnose acute test. And right now it is really unknown whether this will be something useful. We're hoping that it might tell us something about um, exposure and so um, how many people in the region have been exposed to this virus. And then we will find out uh, quite soon in the next few months as these tests become available, we will find out also if this also signifies that a person who's been exposed to this virus is immune. But that is not something we can uh, make an assumption about. We, it's still a question that needs to be studied. Now, there are several questions, as I alluded to, that are around antibody testing. And the main uh, questions is, uh, basically, there's different tests. Some are uh, FDA approved through the emergency fund, through the emergency system, but uh, it, we don't yet know if the presence of antibody impacts the clinical course and the severity of the disease. Uh, we know that some of these antibody tests uh, cross-react with uh, other coronaviruses that are um, common, like the cold viruses, to which uh, we have poor coronaviruses. And uh, if uh, this cross-reactivity may lead to cross-protection. Uh, and the big question is, will the infection protect from future infections? And if yes, how long will this protection uh, last? Uh, and then what are correlates of protection? So all of these questions are questions that are a big question mark. Um, now, Dr. Broderick will go through herd immunity and the concept of herd or, co or herd immunity. But basically, I do want to introduce it because right now, uh, what we know is that in San Diego, contrary to other regions of the United States, such as New York, uh, the uh, population has not been exposed to much virus. We expect that more or less, uh, maybe one or two percent of the population in San Diego will have been exposed to this virus. So. If you think of uh, basically herd immunity, the concept of herd immunity is that you need quite a large amount of the population to be able at least to confer some uh, protection um, through herd immunity. And so uh, in the absence of that, uh, our best hope are public health measures and, um, and uh, the development of a vaccine. So in conclusion, um, what is in the near future? Well, hopefully a vaccine in the more distant future, probably not before one year or, or one year and a half, 
But until a vaccine is developed, some of these uh, public health measures that we have lived for the past month will have to continue. Social distancing is clearly in the picture uh, and it will become a new part of our culture. Facial coverings, we're hearing from the CDC and from the local public health authorities that uh, will continue uh, when we're public facing. And this is to avoid that we transmit to others, not so much to protect us from others, it's simply to serve as a physical barrier from uh, the uh, virus that we could shed from our respiratory system. There will be gradual opening of schools and businesses, but that will have to be with, with a new pattern, with a new culture that uh, allows for uh, physical distancing. And very likely we will have daily symptom screening of persons who work in a congregate setting or in, in the healthcare setting or in schools. Uh, I think that testing will have to be um, optimized and instead of testing a single person to get a single result, possibly we will get to testing a pool of people so that uh, we can see if everybody's negative in that pool, we don't need to, we're all good. If, if that pool testing be, is positive, then we go back and test every sample to find the one that is positive. Uh, home isolation will remain a, a reality for infected people and contact tracing uh, along with very active testing of the population with PCR, uh, contact tracing and quarantine for those exposed uh, will, will have to be continued for us to be successful. Thank you very much and I will let, uh, I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Toriani. While um, Dr. Broderick is um, starting to share her screen and I'm trying to unmute her now, there we go. <laughs> um, I have one question for you, Dr. Toriani, while Dr. Broderick is um, starting to share her screen. Um, when we talked initially, you had um, talked a little bit about um, San Diego hospitals uh, in the county and what they're doing to make sure that anybody who comes in with symptoms is being taken care of in a safe and effective manner. Because we've heard that um, numerous patients did not want to go into the hospital because they were afraid that they might um, get infected with COVID-19. Can you speak to yeah. that? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for bringing this up. Yes, we've seen a decrease in, in patients coming into care. And uh, we believe that, you know, heart attacks, strokes, and, and other appendicitis, other problems are continuing. But basically, uh, a lot of people are not coming into acute care when they need care. So the, the regional hospitals have really gotten together. First of all, all the hospitals share the information about infections and about uh, what the situation is in terms of PPE. And we also share among all the hospitals of the region, uh, our research sources in PPE so that nobody runs out of personal protective equipment uh, or of testing, for instance, so that there is uh, testing. The other thing that we are actively doing, all of the hospitals are doing, all of the hospitals are screening their uh, healthcare workers and uh, anybody entering the system for uh, symptoms of disease. And then some hospitals have also started screening um, their employees for with PCR, uh, to see uh, if any employees are carrying the virus without knowing. We're also screening patients because we believe that if we test, 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 we can better uh, see who's infected taking care of this person, but also trying to uh, better organize uh, 
surgeries and procedures that need to be done and keep everybody safe uh, while respecting social distancing. So this effort is a very, very active effort going on in the county. Another thing that we are working in partnership with San Diego County is that we realized as other uh, places in the United States and in other countries that our skilled nursing facilities, that our rehab units, that our uh, elder care are all uh, having issues with infections. And so we're going out and also testing uh, personnel there and uh, patients so that we can detect disease that might not be as obvious with symptoms so that we can keep everybody safe. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. With that, we're going to throw it to Dr. Broderick. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here tonight um, and thank you so much Dr. Triani for such a fascinating and clear presentation. That was a really fantastic um, 15 minutes. I also want to thank Andrea and um, the Fleet Science Centre for the honour of being asked to speak here tonight. Um, I love taking my two young children to the Science Centre so it's really fantastic to be able to give a bit of payback here. And talking of my two children, I'm going to apologize in advance because even though they were told that mommy's doing something on Zoom and they were to be quiet, obviously they are not listening to that and you might hear them in the background. So I do apologize, but that is our new normal. So um, you'll have to forgive me for the noise of my two children. So my name is Kate Broderick. I'm Senior Vice President of Research and Development at a local biotech company called Inovio. Um, and I think I was asked to speak here tonight specifically due to our activity on developing a vaccine against COVID-19. Um, you know, as I kind of reflect back um, over the last few months, which feel like a few years, to be perfectly honest, um, it's absolutely remarkable. And I can remember as clear as day having my morning cup of tea on the evening of December 31st, reading the BBC News as I do every morning and clicking on a link about a undisclosed, undiagnosed pneumonia outbreak that was occurring in China. And as a scientist, I thought, well, that's fascinating. I must keep an eye on that. And then clearly over the next couple of days, um, it became not just a cluster of um, a, a small um, pneumonia outbreak, it clearly became something much more serious than that. And certainly within a matter of days um, at, at work, we were very clear that this was something that we, we would have to get involved in very quickly. So it's really from the perspective of myself as a scientist who's kind of worked in the field of infectious diseases for a long time now and worked on Ebola vaccines and vaccines for the flu and HIV and MERS and Lassa fever. The situation that we're experiencing at the moment for me um, as a scientist is, is quite unprecedented. And I, I know that word is very much overused at the moment, but certainly in my career, I've never experienced anything like building an airplane when you're flying it. It's um, truly quite a remarkable situation. But I've only got a few slides tonight, so apologize if I, if I do more talking than, than visuals, but I thought I'd start by really, you know, focusing in on what does this, this enemy look like? And um, I don't know if uh, you would agree or disagree, but I've always actually found vi um, viruses to be really quite remarkably beautiful entities. And um, and I use the word entities because, of course, they're not living beings. So it's um, pretty remarkable to think that this guy that you see here on the top panel has really um, been able to shut down the entire globe, which is quite remarkable. But, um, you know, for those of you who aren't virologists, you could probably get about a million viruses on, on the tip of a pin. I mean, these things are absolutely tiny. So the pictures you're looking at here on this slide were taken with something called an electron micro, uh, microscope. 
which um, looks at an extremely strong magnification and is able to put together these incredibly elegant, beautiful depictions of the, vac of the virus. And that's what you're looking at here. And then the lower left picture, which I think is absolutely fascinating, if you look at the little fuchsia dots, those are actually viral particles infecting a cell. So you can really see how they've kind of taken over the cell, which is really everything in the sort of turquoisey color. So I just think it's important sometimes to be able to visualize what, what this actually looks like. So that's what these guys look like. Coronavirus, as you might know, comes from the Latin for crown. And that's because of these kind of spiky, sticky out proteins that are on the surface. Um, of the virus and really actually I'll, I'll come back to that but that's what we have designed our vaccine against is these what we call these spike proteins on the outside um, of the of the virus itself so let's move on okay so when thinking about an outbreak of any kind but of course at the moment we're thinking about COVID-19 but really any outbreak you really want to have a three-pronged approach to um, to getting it under control the first approach, um, very key, and Dr. Toriani spoke about this and the importance of this, is the ability to test for it. So it's absolutely crucial that you can go like you can for the flu, as I'm sure we, we all have done um, on a number of occasions, go into a medical establishment and get a test in a re relatively fast fashion to tell whether you're positive or negative. And really that's um, what's being ramped up at the moment. And, and once we get um, more accessibility to that testing, that's going to really be key in our approach in controlling um, the outbreak. Because as, as you can imagine, if you know you're positive, then you can know to definitely quarantine yourself. When there's some ambiguity, you might feel like, oh, I'm just going to pop out to the supermarket or something like that. So, so the testing really gives us a much better, better ability, I think, to control the movement of people and control the epidemiology so that we understand um, where outbreaks are occurring. So the second part in that three-pronged attack is coming up with therapies, so medicines that would be able to treat you if, if you do become sick with the virus. So you might all have heard about um, you know, testing of a variety of other what we call antiviral drugs that were designed for other viral outbreaks and testing to see whether they could, um, could work against COVID-19, some with some potential results, some less so. But so that's, that's very important. So if you become ill, you want to be able to be treated for that. I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Toriani, of course, is an MD and she can speak much more clearly to this, but my understanding at the moment is really that there's quite limited um, clinical um, um, input here that you can give other than uh, it sounds quite basic, but, you know, fluids, um, um, acetaminophen to, to control fever and such like. There's, there's not a whole lot of medical interventions that are, are proven effective at the moment. So that's another piece of the puzzle that many, many people, of course, are working on at the moment. And then last but not least, and Dr. Toriani spoke very nicely about why this is so crucial, and that's the designing of a vaccine. And that's, that's what myself and my company and many, many others in the scientific community are working on at the moment. Uh, and what a vaccine does, of course, as, as of course many of you know, is allows us then to prevent you getting the infection in the first place, or at least prevent the disease from being as... Um, as um, taking hold as strongly as, as it might do without a vaccine. So it is, it's a really, in my opinion, you know, until we get this vaccine, I don't think we can truly say that this outbreak is under control. And Dr. Toriani is quite correct, and this might not be what everybody wants to hear, but I do think, unfortunately, that 12 to 18 months is, is a realistic time frame for us to have large quantities of tested vaccine. But I can come back to that later. So, so let's move on to the next slide. So, so this is, you know, why is vaccination important? And, and I'm sure you've all maybe seen a, a different schematic similar to this one. But, um, you know, this is why um, when we have a vaccine or vaccines, it, it will be absolutely crucial for the population to be vaccinated. And um, because that really will provide our ability to ensure that there's enough people in the community 
that are um, protected from the disease so that we don't see these huge outbreaks like we're experiencing at the moment. So this is just a very nice visual, I think, um, when obviously very few people are immunized or uh, as is the case just now, we, we, we don't have a vaccine versus the case on the lower part where most people is in, immunized and we can truly control the spread of the disease. So, so it, it really, you know, as I'm, as I'm sure you all know, vaccines in general, and of course we should be very proud here in San Diego um, with, of course, the world famous Salk Institute, but free, vaccines in general for all infectious diseases are absolutely crucial global health tools which have saved millions and millions of lives. And a vaccine for COVID-19 um, should be considered in the same way. So, you know, you can imagine why ourselves at Novio and many, many others in the vaccine development community are working essentially day and night to try and get towards a solution in that front. So, so for those perhaps not intimately familiar with um, how a vaccine works, because it is quite a complex situation, I was going to go through this kind of high level cartoon. Oh, and I should also point out, um, I very cheekily stole all of these slides from the internet. So please don't think I, um, I, I'm excellent at graphics, which I'm not at all. I stole these from the internet. So I apologize to anybody who I might have stolen their graphics from, but they're very beautiful. Uh, I think they, they would do much better than my hand-drawn PowerPoint slides. So this is just a sort of high level graphic about how a vaccine works and how it kind of works within the body to, to um, cause that protection. So, in the, let's start with the top um, left-hand panel, so the blue box. So this is talking about conventional vaccines, and I'm going to put the caveat here that the vaccine I'm working on at Anovio is not a conventional vaccine, but I think this schema shows a kind of a nice idea of how it all works, so I'll come to the differences in, in the later slide. But vaccine, a conventional vaccine generally is either a, a weakened um, virus or a part of the virus, so a protein of the virus that you introduce into the body, and that's generally via um, an IM injection into the muscle, that kind of thing. That's how we all get our annual flu shots. Then the body, which of course is an amazing um, biosystem, is able to say, oh hey, hey, wait a minute, I, um, I don't like the look of this guy, I'm going to um, generate an immune response against it, and that can be generally an antibodies against the virus or the bacteria or can also be things called T cells. But either way, it, all, all you need is your body's own immune system to react to the presence of that vaccine. That enhances your body's natural defenses without causing the illness and really kind of is there saying, okay, if this, if this, if I'm um, infected with this virus, at, another, at a later stage in time, I will be pre-prepared and ready to fight it um, and therefore not allow me to succumb to the disease. So that's kind of in a nutshell, at a very high level, how a vaccine works. So coming to the difference between what a conventional vaccine and what um, the vaccine um, technology that we use at Anovio um, is we, instead of using a virus or a piece of the virus, we actually use a piece of the virus's genetic material. So we kind of go several steps before it becomes a protein, we go to the actual genetic sequence itself. So when I was telling you earlier about me having my cup of tea on the 31st of December, well, on the 10th of January, we received the genetic sequence from the Chinese authority uh, of the virus, and we took that and we uploaded it into our computer algorithm, it kind of did its thing, and after three hours had a fully designed vaccine, DNA-based vaccine against um, the disease, the, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. So it's, it's a small piece of the virus DNA that we put into what we call a DNA backbone, and then just like um, any other standard um, vaccine, we actually inject it into the skin, so a little bit different than your standard flu shot, and then we actually kind of trick the body essentially into becoming a factory for this vaccine. So your own skin cells sort of churn out hundreds and hundreds of thousands and thousands of copies of this tiny little piece of DNA, and it causes your body's own immune system to develop this elusive and desirable immune response. And that's really what, um, what we're hoping to happen. So let's talk about how that's been going so far.
So this is a little bit of a busy slide and I hope it's readable. I realize maybe it's not terribly clear here, but this is kind of a timeline in regards to um, what we at Inovio have been doing over the last few months. So first became apparent on the 31st of December, as we mentioned. The 10th of January, we got the sequence from the Chinese authority, which was a huge um, catalyst for us. It allowed us to really start working. A little, a few weeks later, we were extremely grateful to get funding from an entity called CEPI, that's the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, who really have been remarkably founded essentially to deal with exactly the issue that we're dealing with at the moment. So they were really formed on the basis of the Ebola outbreak to say, what can we do better when we have another viral outbreak? So really, we're incredibly happy to partner with them. We immediately started working on preclinical testing, so that's laboratory testing, and we've completed all of those studies and submitted them to a journal called Nature, Nature Communications, um, and that's going to be published, what we call peer review published, so that means it's re peer reviewed by other scientists and then published for the, the public to see that data, which is very, very important. Um, we've got several other awards, um, again, we're very grateful to the Gates Foundation and also to the Department of Defence which has continued to support our work. And then probably our biggest announcement so far is that on April 6th, we started our human clinical testing. So what we call a phase one clinical trial. So that's taking the small piece of DNA. Now we've tested it in the lab, we've checked um, that it's doing what it should be doing. And now we're saying we're ready to put it into humans and see um, how those immune responses look. And, you know, we're extremely excited to have started that clinical testing and we should have that readout in a few short weeks, um, months before we get those readout. But that's really a huge milestone in the development of a, of a vaccine. The next steps you might quite rightly ask are to go into the next step of clinical testing, which is a phase two trial. It's a much larger trial, probably in the more hundreds to thousands of people and looking for something called efficacy, which is saying, does the vaccine protect you from getting the disease? So that's the next step. And of course, very, very happy to answer any questions about that. So I'm just gonna leave you with saying, thank you very much for listening. And please do try and remain positive because this will end, we will get through this, we will get a vaccine, we will get therapies, we will get um, more testing. Stay positive, cause better days are definitely on their way. And, um, and I'll finish up there and thank you everybody for your time. Wonderful, thank you so much um, Dr. Rorick and also Dr. Toriani. Um, if everybody would like to go into the Q&A section because I've seen Dr. Toriani was busy answering some questions for us and I appreciate that a lot. Um, there was a question, what is the copy number sensitivity of uh, the molecular test? And that apparently depends on the essays from 100 to 400 copies. Um, the other question was, how is the estimated rate of exposure to San Diego residents determined? As we've seen on the slide, it was about 1%. Um, and, oh. We don't know, right. Right now, we don't know, right, because a very small amount of the population has been tested. And, and we don't have any results from the antibodies, but it is estimated estimates uh, are that about one to two percent of the population in San Diego so far has been exposed, which is very low. But we don't have that data yet. Thank you. <laughs> um, another question was, how do you think the changes in our behavior, such as social distancing due to COVID-19, will affect our regular respiratory infection season? And Dr. Toriani had said um, that they already have uh, affected it. Um, she says, we've seen a drop in incidence of all respiratory viruses since the public measures were taken. So there's another silver lining. I like silver linings. <laughs> um, how much of a lag is there in the time that someone takes a test and the time that the results are posted? Um, and Dr. Toriani said that it depends on where the test is done and what test is being done. Commercial labs take about two to four days nowadays. Other labs can take eight to 12 hours. Um, if the rapid test is used, uh, used, then it only takes 30 minutes to an hour. And what is the ratio of positive cases with people with symptoms and those without? 
And apparently that's an excellent question, I agree. <laughs> Dr. Tarayani says, because of the lack of availability of testing, and tests have been done only in persons with a classic CDC symptom. So the fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, and you might have learned in the news this morning that the CDC released six additional um, um, symptoms, and most um, asymptomatic individuals have not been tested. Uh, with more testing availability, we are expanding testing to those um, asymptomatic individuals, so that hopefully we will know more soon um, at the most, 8% of tests are positive. All right, now we're gonna to go to some questions that haven't been answered yet. So we have Ed here. Um, he says he's a biotech veteran with a PhD in genetics. Um, he has read a report that there's a second receptor for the virus. Apparently this is the, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm sure, nicotini acetylcholine receptor according to the Pasteur Institute. And how will this affect vaccine development? Kate. Um, very interesting question. I also have a PhD in genetics, so that's very nice. Um, so we, ours is, um, our vaccine is designed on the spike protein, which is, um, we're looking at ACE2 binding. Um, we haven't looked at the nicotinic receptor um, binding for that, but it's certainly um, something that'd be interesting. But certainly um, our experience with coronavirus has always been around the ACE2 binding receptor. Thank you. And another question for Dr. Broderick. Can you talk a bit about EP device manufacturing ramp up to meet demand for COVID-19? A million doses means how many EP devices needed and are those processes automated to meet demand? And also thank you, thank you and congratulations. Oh. He says. <laughs> Great question. Um, yes, so um, in the interest of time, I didn't go into a ton of detail there. But we kind of have a, what I like to describe as a 21st century approach to delivering um, our vaccines. So basically, we use a little device that um, helps open up the pores and the skin cells to get the DNA into the cell. And that's um, something called electroporation. Um, yes, um, so we do need, to, of course, that those devices to deliver our vaccines. That's absolutely correct. We actually manufacture those in San Diego, so that's something to be very proud of as here, kind of a local manufacturing effort. Certainly as we start talking about millions and millions of doses, then that perhaps exceeds our in-house capability, and we're certainly looking at scaling that up. But um, that's, that's, those discussions are definitely underway as, as we speak. Thank you. And then we have a question from Ben. He says, considering recent studies um, that came in from USC in Los Angeles County and Stanford in Santa Clara County that indicate up to 85 times more people have had the virus than the official confirmed cases would indicate. Are there any studies being conducted in San Diego to identify a more accurate number of people who have had the virus but were asymptomatic? And this trend in most of the emerging studies I have read appears to indicate the virus is highly infectious, but far less deadly than originally thought, on par with the seasonal influenza. This information will obviously be critical in determining the infection fatality rate, <clears throat> which is far more important, <clears throat> excuse me, um, than the case fatality rate. Um, Dr. Torriani, you want to answer that first and then we'll... Yeah, so we clearly need more testing and uh, testing both uh, for the, the active infection uh, and testing of asymptomatic individuals. Uh, studies from China and from uh, other places have shown that actually the that clearly asymptomatic transmission can occur, asymptomatic or post-asymptomatic, and that early on in the infection, the viral load, the amount of viral particles is particularly high, and then it goes down um, uh, in the next uh, seven days. And, and so, uh, clearly, that has to be determined. Uh, we also need to see the validity of the antibody testing, right? And, and so that will help us uh, determine what, what is really the exposure rate 
and therefore then it will allow us to ad adapt the uh, the, the uh, case uh, the infection fatality rate as you say dr Roderick, you have anything to add to that no no i think that was an excellent answer so wonderful um which also um ties into the next question from mary who was asking what is the sensitivity and uh, where did it go are there <laughs> specificity of the antibody test are there false positives uh so there's a couple of things first of all um so the the sensitivity and and of the test is really dependent on the prevalence of the disease so as the disease is more prevalent then the sensitivity is higher the specificity um, is dependent on you know a lot of things but also on the cross reactivity with other viruses and so some of the anti most of the antibody tests are, have high specificity in in terms of ad, viruses other than coronaviruses but uh, they can be still uh, cross uh, uh, reactivity with other coronaviruses now we have studied this um, at UCSD and the test that we use, we've also uh, tested for other seasonal uh, coronaviruses because we, we detect those uh, during the year and we have found it to be, this one to be pretty specific with, the, with a, quite a high specificity rate. Thank you so much. Then we have a question from Lynn who asked the World Health Organization says people who have had the virus are being reinfected and they are not sure that having the virus gives us immunity. How then can a vaccine help and is herd immunity possible? Dr. Broderick, would you mind taking that question? I think it's a great question, but I would hesitate to say that we don't know that definitively yet. So what we don't know is that if you have had the virus, if you're protected or not, we don't know. But it certainly is possible that it doesn't give you protection from getting the, the virus again. I, I would say that um, a vaccine works in a slightly different way so that it's able to really give you a much more amplified immune response than potentially an asymptomatic infection does. Um, and so that's why we believe that an effective vaccine would give you certain amount of protection against the disease. So that's kind of, it's a great question. Unfortunately, because we really have only known about this particular virus for about four months, um, there are still an awful lot of ifs and buts and um, learning about the virus. But um, certainly I have every confidence that an, an effective vaccine would control this outbreak. Thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Broderick, have you tested the vaccine on animals? And if so, when will the data become available? Yep, so that's um, mandated um, for us to do so before we can take it into human clinical testing. So we have done that and um, we have submitted that work to Nature Communications. Um, it's under review and hopefully will be public in the very near future. Wonderful. We have another question on um, the, where did it go? Oh yeah, on the tests. Um, is there a difference in accuracy of different tests? Yes. Uh, so for the PCR-based assays, most of them have, you know, there's two different, when we talk about sensitivity and specificity, there's the, lab sensitivity of or specificity of a test, meaning if I have the virus and I get a test that detects the virus, what, what is, how, how many, what are the chances that this test will, will be positive, will detect this virus? And so 
the the laboratory accuracy is is very high if the test is performed well, meaning if the swab is performed well and and you have uh, you know uh, that RNA material on the swab. And that goes with the sensitivity of about 100 copies or 400 copies. Then there is, if I'm seeing something that I think is COVID and I do this test, what are the chances that this test is going to be positive? And that is, you know, quite dependent on the clinician's acumen or the ability to diagnose. And clearly more severe disease is, is easier, right? Because it appears and there's this pneumonia that appears. What we have seen is manifestations that we don't see normally with, as often with other viruses. And two that I want to mention are loss of smell and loss of taste. We can see that with other respiratory viruses, but in this disease, really, we have, you know, when people have said, I've lost smell, uh, we'll basically guarantee that the test will be COVID positive. Thank you. Um, a question for Dr. Broderick. Um, any other idea how long it might take to get the vaccine tested and approved is, and that's, I, I think, a great question. As I mentioned, there is, uh, you're not the only company even in San Diego that's working on a vaccine, um, but there's institutions and companies worldwide working on the same thing. Are the timelines the same? Are there different ways of getting this done quicker? Yes, and I would love to be able to tell you it can be done quicker, but I, I'm sure as everybody in the audience understands, you know, under normal circumstances, quote unquote normal circumstances, vaccine development takes on average three to five years. Um, you know, so we, we have to kind of put that as, as the sort of the marker in the sand. So what we are doing now, what, what we, but I mean, what we as in the scientific community doing now is, is really quite exceptionally fast. But I do want to reiterate that that does not mean that we are circumventing any necessary safety testing. That's absolutely mandated. There is no way to get around that. There is no way to accelerate that or bypass that. I, I want to that to be very, very clear. But how we are cutting down those timelines is by doing things in parallel that we would normally have done sequentially. Um, and, and so that's really how we've managed to squeeze things down. So for us, from having the vaccine, the sorry, the virus sequence to treating our first patient was 83 days. And that's really quite, quite remarkable. Um, but I do think, now, it becomes quite a complex question because, of course, there's many ways to have vaccine available. So there are what we call emergency youth authorizations that come from the um, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services. There are all sorts of different scenarios here. But I do think, unfortunately, I know it's not what everybody wants to hear, but the 12 to 18 month timeline seems aggressively reasonable to me um, for people to have the expectations that a vaccine would be available to the broader public. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be everyone on the globe. I don't think that's possible. But I think a vaccine would potentially be available for your healthcare workers, people with underlying health conditions, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a fairly reasonable expectation. And when you say 12 to 18 months, that counts from the January timeline? Yeah. Right? OK. Yeah. Um, perfect. So that answers Andrea's question. She, um, how much faster is it normally? And he answered that normally three to five years. Now we're trying to do it in 12 to uh, 18, which I think is uh, fantastic. Um, there's a question of how long it would ta um, take to scale up the production once you've um, done and passed phase three of the trial um, so that there is max va mass vaccination. How long would that take after? Yeah, absolutely. I always think this is a really important point. You can have the best vaccine in the world that has the best immune responses you can imagine. 
but if you can only produce a thousand doses of it, it really is worth not essentially. And um, so really it's that kind of the balance of being able to scale up production and also having an effective vaccine that works. Obviously those those two things are really key components. So certainly from the perspective of our technology, which is DNA based, um, it, it's very rapidly scalable because really it uses a fermenter like you use um, to, I mean, think about beer brewing essentially it's not terribly dissimilar to that very very scalable however when you think of perhaps more complex vaccine development uh, using you know egg-based vaccine development which is how a lot of the flu vaccines are, are that that's much harder um or would take much longer um to to scale up um, its production but you know think about the fact there's seven billion people on the globe right now um, you know, have, getting seven billion doses of vaccine, as you can imagine, is a, is a huge logistical task. So what you generally do is start by identifying your tiers of who needs the vaccine the most. Start at tier one, which would be your healthcare workers, and then kind of go from there until you really expand that population and immunization scenario. Wonderful. I've got a question to throw in for myself, actually, real quick. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned that you get funding from CEPI, from Melinda Gates Foundation, and I know that those um, two funding organizations put a lot of uh, focus on international collaboration between the scientific communities. I also know you are a company. Um, you have proprietary, pro English language is difficult for me sometimes, <laughs> proprietary information. Um, so how do you work with other countries, with other scientists in the world um, to move this along as fast as we can? With that, we're still protecting your IP. Absolutely. Um, firstly, I would think if there is one bright spot that's come out of the situation we're in at the moment, it is the true solidarity that I've seen between scientists, between clinicians, um, and really sharing the knowledge, sharing reagents, sharing samples that I personally have never experienced before. So that's a really, really heartwarming thing from a scientific perspective. We have developed a, personally a very um, global um, coalition. We, we're working with teams in China, in Australia, in the UK, um, in Korea, a, a vast kind of a range. But also to your earlier point, um, when, you know, very much central to the tenet of what we do at Inovio, it's to ensure global access of vaccines. So it's to ensure that not just the richest countries in the world have access to our vaccines, but everybody has the potential access of our vaccine. And, and really, of course, that's very much shared in the mission of the Gates Foundation, as you can imagine, and also CEPI. So um, we very much share in that um, that belief that um, you know vaccination should not just be for the people who can afford it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I know we're running a little bit over time, but there is um, there are two more questions that I would like to address. Jen is asking, as recently as this evening, we've been told that the wearing of face mask is to minimize the potential spread of the virus from us to others, not to protect ourselves from the virus. That seems to ignore a reason why medical personnel wear masks, face shields, and more. Is that not to actually protect the medical personnel? Um, Jen is concerned that uh, we are not being told to wear masks for our protection because then there would not be enough for medical professionals. Could you elaborate on that, Dr. Toriani? Yeah, so I, I think this is a, a very good question. And, and um, uh, in, in Asia, for instance, uh, people wear masks and part of this is because of reasons of pollution, but also because it's a different culture. And here we have not, in the Western world, we have not used this. Um, I think that for me, what works for me uh, is in, in this evolution of how we see you know, uh, face coverings and, and masks and et cetera. Of course, in the medical field, we have to diagnose, we have to treat people who have patients who have a, a disease that is infectious, right? And we use these protections uh, depending on the way this disease is transmitted. And so 
we are very used, but our exposure is an exposure that is, you know, exposure to many diseases. Uh, if you work in in um, an, an emergency department. I think that the concept of facial covering is really more for the protection of others, uh, simply because it serves as a physical barrier. Now, of course, it will also possibly, if this is not an airborne disease, so I need a disease that is very, very, very small particles, using a facial covering will also protect your your face and your mucosae. Um, and so I think that uh, the fact that public health has now said that basically you do have to wear a facial covering and I believe that this is going to be uh, an order that will remain in place uh, when I speak to my colleagues in public health. I actually think it's a, it's a new way of seeing things. And so it's, it's not in contradiction or because um, that, for instance, um, um, a surgical mask is not better than a, um, a cloth mask uh, necessarily. Some surgical masks are extremely flimsy. And so um, they, they don't protect more than a facial covering. So I think it's, it's you know, it's, it, it's, I think it's a distinction because yes, we have, we want to make sure that there isn't, that we don't run out in the healthcare environment and that people wouldn't get infected um, when they need to treat more patients. But I, I, I don't think it's a contradiction. I think it actually uh, meshes very well, the fact of using facial coverings and kind of a change in our, in our society. Yeah, and I think we should um, also point out that there is difference in masks. So the, um, the masks being used in hospitals, um, the N95 that you hear a lot in the news, have a different protection and filtering system than um, a surgical mask or um, you know, the mask that I'm just making at home. Um, so they do protect better than, than our mask. So when you say that we're using our face, face mask that we're making at home, that are really more meant that if you are asymptomatic and you don't want to spread, you wear the mask because then the droplets that you might release by speaking to somebody will not get out. Um, but the mask itself might not be as protective as professional wear in the hospital. Right. But that whole question of, of, you know, N95s, so the rest of the world is not using N95s. Yeah. The rest of the world is using face shields to mm -hmm. take away the droplets and then uh, a, a mask that, that has a good filtration, but not necessarily an N95. In the United States, uh, there has been a push to wear N95s. And we use them, particularly in this region, we use them for what we call aerosol generating procedures, uh, which can be generated when people are needing to be intubated, help to breathe. Uh, and so we, we definitely use them for that, but we do use quite a bit of, of surgical masks. Oh, wonderful. That's great, John. Thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Um, and then, um, because we're running quite a little bit over, um, I want to give a shout out to my uh, coworker, Raiza, who's been wonderful at paraphrasing um, the answers that were given here. So, uh, I see an answer that a question that we have answered before um, on whether a vaccine can be effective um, if, a, um, if having the disease did not. Um, hinder you from getting it again. So please take a look at the answers questions. And then I'm sorry that we can't um, get to all of the um, questions, um, but we've, we're about 10 minutes over. So um, I think we're closing it out here. Like I said, if you have any specific questions left for us, 
um, email them to me. It's um, adultprograms at rhfleet, and I will try to reach out to our wonderful speakers for tonight. Um, also, this was the first event in a three-part series, so we have two more um, of the amazing San Diego's Amazing Race to Combat COVID-19 talks. The next one is on May 26, and we'll be talking to researchers from the Sanford Burnham Prebis Medical Discovery Institute um, as they are racing to find treatment. Uh, that was one of the, the steps that both Dr. Toriani and Dr. Brodick have talked about to successfully combat this. Um, so that we can treat people who go through COVID-19, especially the worst cases in the hospital, that we can treat them successfully. Um, so we're going to talk about that on uh, May 26th. And then June 22nd, um, we have another one, and we're going to be talking about antibodies and how uh, researchers are trying to find and reproduce antibodies that can be used for treatment um, and also protection for healthcare workers in the medical field as they're dealing with this crisis in the hospital. Um, just visit out our website, fleetscience.org, um, and we hope you'll come to many more of these events. We'll have um, a, um, a Sky Tonight and Astronomy Show coming up on May 6th. There's many more things um, to discover as the fleet is really, really proud to connect everyone in City County to the power and possibilities of science to create a better world. And I think our fantastic speakers tonight, Dr. Broderick and Dr. Toriani, have shown how San Diego scientists really live up to that um, credo of uh, using science to create a better world and helping us solve some of the biggest problems we are facing. Thank you so much, Dr. Broderick, Dr. Toriani, for joining us tonight. It was Hi, and thank you. <laughs> Raisa, thank you thank for giving you. us this opportunity. You're very thank welcome. Thank you very much. Raisa, thank you so much for your help tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us. And I hope we'll see you soon at another event. Thank you and have a great night. Bye everybody bye. Stay safe Good and healthy out there. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.